Yeah. Now, things are getting, uh, electricity-wise, things are really getting tough here. Um, the installers, they can't keep up. I actually, the guy told me, you know, I was so fortunate. Um, my order went in a week before we had this enforced uh, um, solar. So, so our, our uh, power supplier, ESCOM, um, because the municipalities owe them millions and millions, actually hundreds of millions of rands, because it, the money was stolen over the years. So they didn't pay for electricity supply. Um, and it's you, you can't believe the amount of fraud. Ugh. But anyway, so so um, then the power utility just says, sorry, we cut you off for two hours, four times a day. That is on top of what we call load shedding. That's another three times two hours a day. That works up to 14 hours without electricity. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, since then, um, no more, none of that. I put in a brand new aircon here in my... In my um, in my study, okay, uh, courtesy of the bank, instead of getting a golden watch, they asked me what I would like. I said, I would like an aircon. So they paid for an aircon. And that was about, I don't know, you, you used to ask about, what is 10,000 rands? It's about 700 US dollars, I think. I, 600, 600 installed or whatever. But I've got a beautiful brand new aircon and I'm sitting here and it's so like hot and I'm all cool. So everybody knows we are live now. Okay, so I mustn't do all the antics. Okay. <laughs> now, folks, um, uh, I don't know if you saw the advert um, this morning, what I'm going to talk about. So um, you, you, you might want to put some, some head muffs on um, and so on. I'm, I'm, I'm very calm, um, but we, I'm going to share some things this evening that might shock you. Um, and it's not, it's, not, it's not because I want to want to really um, hurt anybody or whatever, but there's been things said that I've for a while kept quiet about because I thought as a good Seventh-day Adventist Christian, okay, maybe I should not say those things. And um, it's not things that I'm saying. It's merely what I'm quoting, what our dear friend is saying. And um, yeah, maybe you can make up your own mind around certain things. Uh, so yeah, anyways. Uh, Sandy, when do you want me to start? Oh, well, we got a couple of minutes, so. Okay. And here's, here's Ethelin as well. Ethelin, is the sun shining your way? I thought there was snow. She sent me a picture. It looked like somewhere in the middle of the North Pole the other day. Ethelin? That's, that's up about an hour and a half or so from Chris to Idaho. I think Chris's snow is gone. I don't know, Ethelin, if you still have snow? No. Yes, it's not snowing. It rained a little bit, very fine rain. Is that the right term? We still have about an inch and we're expecting the snow again this week. Oh. Yeah. Sure, Eddie sure, sure. sure. To plow about six inches of snow last Thursday from the, for, from the driveway. Sure. About a, a half a mile long. Yep, oh, but, but, but we're not in the North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, goodness, I tell you. I'm using my phone right now because Eddie is still trying to connect our computer, our, what's this, our internet is just so slow with all this uh, bad weather. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sandy, we're supposed to meet with Sarah. It's about two weeks ago, but we have to cancel it because of the bad weather and the host is like, they're all, they have been hit by a bug. Oh. Yeah. Were the you Lukens. going, someone's got sick? Yeah, the, the Lukens, the doctor's family. So oh, they have okay. a meeting. Yeah. Here. yeah. Well, you don't want to be around that because you never know. Yep. Did you see little Elijah's head? Nope. He fell off a chair and cut his little head. Oh, really? Cry. He didn't get stitches, but they glued it. It was up here somewhere. It was like oh. little. <laughs> oh. He was a brave boy, though. He was fine, and she said he didn't cry. He did uh -huh. what happened, but then he didn't, and they took him to the ER, and... His little brains are fine. She said he's tough. <laughs> and I'm like, grandma's not. 
broke my heart, little man. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said they were going to go see you that I never heard anymore. So I guess that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. It was canceled because the host, like, they're not feeling good. And then it was good that it was canceled because during that time it was windy, snowy, cloudy. I said all the D, all day. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, are you ready? I guess we can go ahead and uh, get started. Okay. Let's share screen, share sound. Okay. All right. All right. So let's open that. Sorry, I'm just opening a couple of windows so I can see the people here. So I can see who is uh, who is sleeping and uh, who's actually listening okay so good morning everybody and i hope you are having a wonderful sabbath and it's so nice to see all of you folks again it's been a very very busy couple of weeks for me and actually a couple of months with me coming up to to uh my retirement uh the lord has richly blessed me uh with so many things in so many ways um i got a phone call on or an email on friday of another possibility of a job uh, on a second offer that I have now on on, on sort of ongoing and seeing what's going to happen. And I praise the Lord for the opportunity and and just that that people have seen uh, what I can contribute uh, to to them. And um, please pray for me for that. And also, like I said, for Diane, for her health. but otherwise, things are going well. Tomorrow, I am turning 60. Okay, so I'm now officially older than all of you, especially Violet. Okay, I know I'm older than Violet now. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's been an interesting week as well, a couple of weeks. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about this evening. And Sandy, once again, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. I started off with another sermon, and then this happened. And I thought, you know what, initially I, I took some counsel on to whether to speak about it or not. And some people said don't and other people said do. And I prayed about it and I opened my YouTube and the thing that popped up on the YouTube was Elder Solomon Kuno's um, uh, presentation on YouTube on this specific topic. And um, yeah, I, get, I still get very emotional when I talk about him. Um, we, 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 we were the two musketeers here in South Africa that got blamed for everything, <laughs> feast keeping. And, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I really, really strongly miss the man and so forth. So this evening, I'm, or this morning, I want to just really talk. Your, your dad used to call a doodle. He says, you know, when you, when you just throw thoughts around and things around and, and I started that off in this, in this presentation. Uh, when I started preparing it, and I didn't realize just how much information I had collected over the last 10 years um, as this whole, um, I won't call it controversy, maybe it should be called a controversy, but this whole discussion around the early convocations, feast keeping, what happened to me, you've all seen my sad story. I'm going to just touch on certain issues just to make it relevant for this video. Um, maybe show uh, that one little video again that, that he takes a bit of offense to, um, that he answered me on. But I want to put the context properly this evening, and I'm really, really going to try and do it in a, um, in a respectful manner to, to the good doctor. Um, I'm just out of the blocks. I'm not a theologian. Um, I've never claimed to be one. Uh, I'm one of the lay people he refers to. Um, in my country, you know, in my language, lay means something different. It's like in your country, a geezer means something different. So, uh, so lay in, uh, in my, my language actually means lazy. Um, so in Afrikaans, when you say iemand is lay, it means somebody is lazy. So I always, that always pops up in my head when, I, when he talks about lay people. So let us pray to open. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as as your people, Lord. And this morning we pray for all 
seven Adventists worldwide. We pray for every single good soul out there, Lord, that is earnestly working to bring your word to the people. And Lord, in these final hours, in these closing times, let us keep up our chins and be of good joy. Let us understand that you, you will keep us, Lord, even in the worst of times. And I've seen that here in my country, as you've kept your hand over us, you've provided for us, and we've been able to go forward. And we can sing your praise for that. Be with these dear people watching this evening, being part of this broadcast. And Lord, pray for me as well. Please, Lord, let, let my heart be in your hands. Let my tongue be in your hands. Let this be something that is worthy of you. I ask this in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. So I'm putting out my normal disclaimer uh, just in terms of Sandy. And Sandy has no idea what I'm going to talk about this evening. Let me just put that out there immediately uh, to protect her from any, anything out there. Um, I know Solomon Kulu used to do it as well. And I say the thoughts and studies presented here are my own. Would not necessarily represent the thoughts and studies of the people attending, nor might it represent the views of Bible Exploration TV. The conversations I referred to in a uh, year uh, I received uh, and was sent by email between myself and Dr. Ronda Priya during January, February 2023 and earlier. And Dr. Priya has asked that in the spirit of openness and transparency, I share his comments. This is the basis of this presentation. And then also, I decided after, and I'm not a guy who really, really, will, you know, goes for this thing about signs and wonders and things, although I've seen too many to, to not believe it. But when I saw Elder Solomon's uh, presentation pop up on YouTube early in the week, I knew I had to do this. So my dedication is to him and to uh, other soldier who fought valiantly for the feast truth. And it so many times uh, went to, to, to Dr. Priya to try and speak to him. Uh, I think more than anybody else that I knew, Elder Clyde Langley. So John 16, 2, 3 says, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whoever killeth you will think that he doth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So I'm asking a question this evening, what is doctrine and what is truth? In the room of uh, December 20, 1892, it says, there is no excuse for anyone in taking the position that there is no more truth to be revealed and that all our expositions of scripture are without an error. The fact that certain doctrines have been held as truth for many years by our people is not proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth, and truth cannot afford to be fair. No true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. So who is this gentleman that for so many years has uh, written about peacekeeping, visited Terra Bella, I think it was in 2011-12, if I remember what it is in the books, um, has written so much, traveled the, the world basically, and has spoken on the topic of peacekeeping. Well, Dr. Ronda Priya earned his PhD from the University of Western Cape in South Africa, and his PhD from the University of South Africa, UNISA, as well as three master's degrees a, and a D-min from uh, Andrews University, USA. Dr. De Priya is a full-time professor who is an outstanding teacher and researcher. Um, he and his wife, Linda, have served as missionaries in Asia, Africa, South America. Professor Tafria was named as Humanitarian of the Year, Teacher of the Year, Researcher of the Year, and Alumnus of the Year. He served as the main editor for various books, besides the ones he has written himself. After turning 60, he walked and ran seven marathons in seven days in seven European nations. Later, he became the co-founder of the F5 Challenge, uh, an online group with a mission to empower young people through active lifestyle. So as you can see on the, on the screen there, I have included the six books that I own uh, of Dr. De Priya's. Um, so just to, to make sure that, that I do own them, 
but I have them here with me at the moment. They're all on the th thing. So those are not screenshots. Those are actually, I scanned them in. I do actually own all of these books, just then to, to make sure that there's no misunderstanding uh, when I quote from these books that I actually possess and own them. So early in 2013, when my journey started with Bible explorations, uh, with the early convocations, me having that awesome, awesome, awesome year, meeting Sandy and Elder John and all you good folk as well, there was, of course, a lot of controversy going on. And so um, with some of the elders and so on from our sister church up in Howick, we are Peter Mattisburg Trelawney Church, they are Howick's church out there. Uh, they wrote to, to Ron de Pree, and this was still when I was still thinking about the feast. There was nothing more. I was, um, I was, I was, I think I was about to go overseas October 10th. We were about to fly to America uh, in that next month. Uh, and I was all excited. And the Howick church wrote to, to Ron de Pree and asked him a question of, you know, what is your, your view? On peacekeepers, and he wrote in response to some of the teachings creeping into our church. This letter from Ron de Pria, his full 120 page exposition is available on request. Greetings is in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. I trust that this letter will be a blessing to all. Since this matter of feasts and lunar issues, as related in the Bible, etc., necessitates much more extensive explanation, I shall include an attachment covering the questions and answers related to the Old Testament issues specifically for use as you see and follow God's guidance. So he talks about, he went, uh, he's done extensive uh, investigation over the years. You can go read this later if you want to. I can send it to you as well. He took considerable time to read and watch the DVD, listen to the materials. He, of course, went to visit Terra Bella, as you'll see in the middle of that thing, as part of their Passover and then camp meeting. And by the way, later I went to Tabernacles Camp Meeting in North California. Um, while my experience at Terra Bella revealed that a serious and happy atmosphere was obvious, it became increasingly apparent that the entire focus of this group was primarily on the necessity of observing the ancient feasts or festivals, essentially outlined briefly in Leviticus 23, 46, 36. So also much through, uh, although much more subtle, it became clear to me that there was a strong negative attitude towards the official SDA church, including a rather arrogant spirit towards the church as well. This was very sad to see and experience. Over time, I was able to do some careful biblical research into my significant argument put forward by those who promote and observe these festivals. In brief, my findings as follows. And then he starts off by saying, you know, these feast days have all been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and continue to keep these festivals is actually an insult to Job. And he misquotes uh, Review and Herald, June 14, 1898. Okay, so that is the sort of ambit where we kick off this evening. And um, for just for this video, and please bear with me, there's a lot of people who haven't seen it. I'm going to play the eight minutes that he came, uh, and this is the last day call it the question and answers session. There's virtually four people in that church. I know that because my good friend Samuel Jacobs was there and I'd asked him to put forward some questions uh, that I got from various people all over the world, uh, uh, the Drakes and uh, 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 I, know, I know Elder John gave me some stuff and there was a lot of things uh, that, that I got at that stage, which I put into a thing and sent through my friend to this session, okay? And uh, I'm going to play this is about six to eight minutes. So please bear with me. Um, I, I know you guys have seen it, but I'll need to put the context in here as we go along because it will become more apparent and there are some new things that I want to point out here as well. Just say if you can't hear it. Never have they admitted that everything I'm presenting is not my view, but everything I present is what we as Adventists officially believe, such as in the lesson quarterly, such as in 27 fundamentals or 28 fundamentals. Why will they not honestly, openly, forthrightly step forward and say, we who are feast keepers have rejected the Adventist message. We've, re we've given up 27 or 28 fundamentals book. We don't believe what Seventh Adventists believe. We don't accept the lesson quarter that's prepared for the whole world. It's curious to me, and maybe somebody here could explain to me one day, why is it that the feast keepers, instead of admitting honestly where they are, that they are not actually 
authentic Seventh-day Adventists. They are, an, are, are believing contrary to the faith. They have rejected, in essence, Ellen White, and they are going against Adventism. The curious thing is, why is it that they've decided they are saying Ron Dupre is the problem? Or Ron Dupre is, I find that curious. Now, remember, as I said repeatedly, this is not my personal view. And I'm saddened that they have decided to try to distract, whether they're doing it intentionally or not, I don't know, but they've distracted people to think that I am the one, and guess what, folks, it's not me. I'm simply representing the church. So I call upon my feast keepers. Time to be honest, time to be open, time to become authentic Adventists. It's a challenge. I put forward, I know it's on a DVD, and it will be shared. Come on, folks, let's become honest, open, authentic Adventists. Never have they admitted. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show of that. And as you know, later on, um, about a year, well, last year, I made the, 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 my testimony, which you've all watched, which included that, okay? And so going back to 2017, to put a bit of further context to this, he had written me an email after my first camp meeting out of the church, and uh, I had done a testimony, which I said certain things again, and it was out there. And uh, he said to me, greetings, Brother Hein, perhaps I'm misunderstanding something here. Since Facebook, you referred to me as a coward and, a down, and downright evil. It seemed to me that we needed to take serious counsel of Scripture, specifically Matthew 5, 23 to 25, and Luke 17, 3 to 5, Matthew 18, etc., etc. I believe that prayer is indispensable, but it must be followed up with appropriate action as well. God's grace to you, joyful with Jesus, on the prayer. And so he obviously had watched what I had said, but on the, the YouTube video, he'd actually printed there that he prayed for me because I was talking nonsense, blah, blah, blah. So there's a whole thing on there. If you want to go read it, I'm going to bother too much with that. I responded uh, by saying the following, maybe you should ponder what I'm saying, why I'm saying those things. Invoking Matthew 5 means an issue exists. What context are you using it in? It's not my habit to make statements like you mentioned, but I do a stand with them in the context of what happened in 2014, pre your visit to my then congregation during and after. I have audio recordings, emails, and video, but all substantiating my comments. Like you say, Ron, you don't know me, but you have been directly and indirectly responsible for a lot of unfortunate events that caused a lot of sorrow and pain that is befalling a good number of people, including me and my family, by creating the view in the minds of other good people of my feast keepers, as you call us. The sad thing is that you either don't know, which I doubt, or you are trying to justify those actions. And for what? So my question remains, what do you wish to achieve? And then he came back to me, he's just going on about my goals, simply to be faithful to counsel of Jesus. So according to him, uh, he wants to put stuff right. Okay. Um, and this is now four years after I've gone through four years of being treated like a leper by my own church and uh, being persecuted by my own church for the mere fact, not that I promoted it, but for the mere fact that I believe as I believed. Okay. I'd never, ever, ever during from the period 2013 right up until 2018 had I ever, ever promoted the feast in the church, ever. Okay, and so it goes on, all right, and then suddenly I decided not to answer and walk away from it, okay, at that stage, and then out of the blue, you can see the date there, 29th of the 1st, 2023, in the middle of the night, I get this email popping up, it actually woke me up, and I couldn't believe my eyes, because it said, greetings, Brother Hein, I know it's been some years that we were last in contact with each other. However, I got to listen and watch your talk, I believe sometime in 2019, it truly really saddened me, and I stopped to pray for you, especially since I listened to, I concluded that you made some statements about me that are not accurate or factual, such as me being allegedly angry, and uh, that, you, uh, um, uh, uh, that you had not come to the presentation I, I'd made. Also, as that I would deny, et cetera, et cetera. My dear brother, as you know, we all have to answer to our creator and ultimately. So though what you publicly shared was painful, I've chosen to say as Jesus that Father forgive them for they do not know what they do. Okay. I know we can quote the same at him. Perhaps those who watch your talk will take time to actually read my book, which I'm willing to send free to anyone. 
who would like to see what is in it in context. So folks, I've got to share a, 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 a slide later on and I will share the good doctor's email with you and you are welcome to then uh, just for the free book, put my name in, in there and say that, that you've listened to it because I'm going to send them a copy of this uh, uh, presentation as well. Uh, and uh, as such, um, he will be seeing what, what I'm saying here is just for, as he said, for, for, for openness and for honesty. Uh, so you're not saying that, that I'm saying that something he did not say. Also, the careful listener would have noticed in my presentation, even as you exited it, which is what I just showed you, I repeatedly mentioned that I was sharing, uh, it's actually a book called Seven Day, What Seven Day Adventists Believe, which is produced by the Ministerial Association of the Renal Conference and was put together by literally hundreds of faithful Adventist pastors, scholars, and administrators, as it states in the book itself. Yet somewhat strangely, you never mentioned this factor. Um, okay, I'll talk about that just now. Instead, you chose to quote from Dr. Richard Lofer, whose claim about Colossians 2.14 directly contradicts the above-mentioned book. So uh, according to him, Richard Lofer's uh, comments on, on, on Colossians 2.14.16 contradicts what, um, uh, the, what Adventists believe, according to the book. Okay. Um, also, you kept speaking as though this was merely the view of Ron de Priya. In short, when I speak about the fact that feast keepers hide things, what you did in, in this talk seems to me to be a clear example of such action. So he's saying, well, you, you know, you're still doing that hiding thing. You still hide from, from whatever. So my brother, why did you not put on the screen the clear statements as found in the various places in what Seventh-day Adventists believe, which reveal that what I share is fully in accord with standard SDA beliefs? And by the way, that Andrew's study Bible you mentioned is not an official book. Okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, it is not produced by an official department of the GC, as was Seven Day Adventists Believe. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, instead of inaccurate and hopefully unintentional misinformation, we could share the complete truth with people for Christ's sake? I gently appeal to you, dear brother, joyful on the journey with Jesus. And you would note at the bottom here that the dear doctor, uh, he has got many titles. Okay. Um, he's a very learned man. So I took a day or two and I replied to him. And I said, good morning, Ron. I've given your email some prayerful consideration. And everything I've said in my presentations is factual. And I stand by that. As regards the book, what Seven Day Adventists believes, a couple of things. Under the title in the book, uh, a word about fundamental beliefs of, of uh, SDAs, it gives the background to why that book was produced. It says the following, although this volume is not officially voted statement, and it says in brackets, only the summary of statements have officially been voted by the GC in session, it may be viewed as a representative of what SDAs believe. So that book that Rhonda Priya is, uh, is referring to the whole time, okay, okay, and the subsequent commentary in it is not a voted statement, but merely interpretation of what SDAs believe. I suggested that he read the intro. The only place in the commentary that refers to the feast, uh, uh, and by way of Col Colossians 2.16 and Galatians 14, is under the heading of the Sabbath in a small paragraph, and it mentions the misinterpretation of Colossians 2.16 as per your feast book and your Colossians, uh, your Sabbath book on Colossians, okay? And then goes on to contradict your book by misquoting Galatians 14, by saying that Paul was referring to the Jewish holidays. You yourself confirmed in your book that there's no evidence that Paul was referring to the Jewish holidays in Galatians 14. And this was also done by many other well-known SDA authors. So the book done by those pastors and others has some mistakes in it. So it may come as some surprise to you. I explained to you, I met with Elofer several times. Uh, and Elofer, and I actually looked at the email tonight. Elofer still said to me, I am employed by the GC. These other people are not. And that includes Ron de Priya. So what I tell you is correct. And I've got it in the email. Okay. I also referred to, to my meeting with Molly Steenson and our good relationship over the years, and that I'd shared the whole palaver around the feast with her because I wanted to give her the opportunity 
to decide if she still wanted to do business with me and my bookshop uh, after she knew that I was a feastkeeper. And of course, with Ron being on 3ABN, and he was very, very pleased to be on there. He refers to it in so many of his presentations and books. Uh, it's like, actually, like, really, actually, sometimes becomes too much. It's like me sometimes when I say the same thing over and over again. But, you know, we do that, uh, especially if things is important to us. And I said, you know, she was horrified about your unchristlike act. We had a very good working relationship and friendship that grew stronger after this. As I continued to be an agent for 3ABN in South Africa until I left the church in 2017. Presentations on 3ABN were subsequently done by the Jewish SDA to disprove your theory on Colossians 2.16. The links are below. They all knew what happened in Trelawney in 2014. And they did. Because I made sure they knew what was going on. And so your comment on the Andrew Study Bible makes me laugh. By the way, that Andrew Study Bible you mentioned is not an official book and was produced because it was not produced by any official department in the GC. I said, you really believe that the fundamentals, those what Adventists believe is the be all and end all of Adventism. As regards the study Bible, maybe you should get a copy and read who the project committee and contributors was. They occupied positions in all levels of the church, including the GC. And in, in any case, I will refer your concern to an Andrea Luxton who is currently the big boss of Andrews University to confirm to me if Andrews Bible can be considered a sound guide. So let's be clear, none of your books, including the Fearful Feast book was sanctioned by the church or the GC. And I said to him, maybe as you now retire, because he's just retired from another church, um, literally retired for the second time, maybe you should do in some introspection on how you could done things differently. I've seen many people who have been spiritually ruined because of your incorrect and misguided stance on Colossians 2.16 and the early convocations. I will leave you with a comment that a very senior SDA friend and a non feast keeper that I shared your email with sent me. He said, I've now gone through everything and now see what happened. What is surprising to me is the church has, has an action against feast holders or festival holders. Look further in Colossians 2, 16, let no one judge you in food and drink or regarding a festival or new moons or Sabbaths. How on earth can they make this a matter of life and death? If people are circumcised today, no one cares if it leads to hell. Yet if you celebrate the festival, then hell, it's hell's business. What is the church action against it? And yet they encourage it for the sake of the Jews. Festivals cannot harm anyone. On the contrary, they are a means of reminding us of the contingencies of the future. I believe the autumn festivals are yet to be fulfilled, of which uh, will only be fulfilled in heaven. I'm coming, uh, and then he wants to post something about Colossians 2.16 on his Facebook thread. And uh, yeah, and he's saying to me, I see that he's now hiding behind the, the church's books and doctrines. First, he stops praying for you. I think he miswrote what Ron wrote. And then he prays, Father, forgive. He throws you with his pedigree at the end of the letter. He really wants to let you know that you are nothing and he has the knowledge in his pocket. He says, I'm judging now. This is spiritual warfare and you have to read your opponent's attitude. So I said back to Ron, I said, I'm no longer a member of the GCSDA church. So your comments and issues have little value to me, but I will keep on exposing the falseness that has infiltrated the church, however. And then I said to him, who is really hiding, Ron? He came back to me. And I know this is a bit long-winded, but I'm going to get into it now. And he said to me, greetings, Brother Hein. Thanks for your response. Thanks for being able to take some time to check it. Okay. Uh, he says, please think about the importance of seeing the current difference we hold on the issue, not as merely a personal view that I may hold, but rather as the fact that it's the interpretation of the feast is actually promoted in, once again, what Seventh-day Adventists believe which is in fact the Ministerial Association now a global Adventist church has put out. I would greatly appreciate it if you could be, uh, begin to make people aware of this fact. And this is why I'm doing this thing tonight. So also, if you look at my book, Fee uh, Feast Keeping the Faithful, you'll notice that the appeal I made at the end is actually based on a similar appeal made by a feast keeper. Now, I, I doubt it, okay? Because what he wrote at the end, he wrote on behalf of Jesus, and that's blasphemy. I don't care if another feast keeper does that. I don't care if who does it. If you write a, a letter like you are Jesus, I was taught that's blasphemy. Okay? 
So if you want to tit for tat, that's your problem. It's still blasphemy. In other words, I use this logic and concepts to make the same basic appeal, but in the opposite direction. So, you know, he, he likes to play games. He's, he's, he's the one who really is the magician here. He's, he, he likes to show his, his, uh, his knowledge and so on. And that is, is fantastically well learned. I was saddened to hear, hear, if I correctly recall, that you allegedly keep that as blasphemy. This was intended to be a heartfelt appeal. I doubt it. I, Ron, I really seriously doubt that. Okay. I suggest you go read it again. So incidentally, when you mentioned correctly that in the USA, Jewish Adventists mark and do not actually keep their fees, I believe that you are correct in stating that. Oh my goodness. I'm actually correct in something. In other words, beside those who may participate merely since um, it's part of the Jewish culture, like many Adventists celebrate Thanksgiving Day, those who mark the feast do it in a manner similar to the standard Adventist churches around Easter and Christmas. So now he's saying Passover, Tabernacles is sort of the same thing as Christmas and Easter. They Adventists keep it the same way. Well, I hope there's some South African Adventists watching this as well, because um, your, your good doctor here thinks that Christmas, Easter, Passover, Tabernacles, all the same. No problem. Okay? Because they use it to connect and reach out to people not of our faith. No, doctor. No, 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 no. You would know very well that those people keep those things, especially the Jewish Adventists, as part of their liturgy. And they actually say that. And if you want proof, we can do that one as well. Because I personally attended the Jewish Adventist Theological Group and they invited me to attend. One more thing, thanks for pointing out the footnote of mine positively regarding the comments on Galatians 4.10. Incidentally, don't if you respond, I'll be busy, whatever, whatever, whatever. Then, okay, the whole thing. So let's quickly deal with the comments. So and I'm going to go through it quickly. Uh, you guys are probably fast asleep and bored by now. So why did I comment that uh, the prayer was angry? Well, first of all, the people at the presentations that, those years, and both in Sadaf and uh, Peter and them, as well as down here in South Africa, I was told by Nolis and the pastor, as well as people who attended, that Mr. P Dr. Priya was not happy that I did not attend the lectures. Uh, you could also see in, the, in his manner, just if, you, if you've got any knowledge of body language, the way he was going on about the unauthentic seven-day Adventists, I don't think he wanted to say that, but... I think he was frustrated and you could really see that things were getting to him. And that body, body language says a lot. And then obviously subsequent emails, et cetera, that I got when, when we on certain of feedback that I got on some of my presentations I've done after that, they, they also, people pick up that he was angry and impatient. So let's just quickly talk about this magic book that he holds up every time. You know, this one that says what Adventists believe. Okay, we all know that famous book. It is the Creed and Bible of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's actually, by Dr. Dupri actually quotes it more than he quotes the Bible in these emails. And if you go through his books, you will see repeatedly he refers back to this book. Okay. Now, I just want to read one, one thing here on the slide. It says, the first step of apostasy is to set up a creed telling us what we shall believe. The second is to make that creed a test of fellowship. And feastkeeping has been made at creed of fellowship, guys. We know that. In the end, South Africa, let me reiterate. If you're a feastkeeper and you want to join the church, they're not going to allow you there. They're going to stop you at the front door. That's a fact. Third is to try members by that creed. I was tried by that creed. Fourth is to denounce as heretics. You want to see the emails? I've got them. I was called a heretic many times and worse. Antichrist, okay, which is Dr. Dupree's favorite uh, 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 thing. Uh, for uh, 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 peacekeepers. I'll just play that clip in a second. And fifth, commence persecution against such. So folks, first of all, let, let, let's, let's be very clear, okay? Keeping the feast in the Seventh-day Adventist church is not a voted statement. There's no voted statement against not keeping it. What this is, is pure defending of a doctrine, okay? which will be defended at all costs. And I'll show you in a moment why. And, and the people that, that, that were, were being uh, sort of pushed out and attacked because of a different view in the church. Because that's the only way you can actually prove Dr. Dupree's theory is by downing other people. So Lothborough wrote that. Okay. 
just it was very interesting you know the first two uh seminary Adventist principles in 1889 was just two okay there's one god a spiritual being creator of all things eternal innocent uh etc etc represented by his representative of the holy spirit hmm, okay and then one lord jesus christ the eternal father by whom he created all things so there's definitely god the father and god the son yeah but you know as, as walter fight said on on the thing that that uh, david Barron was doing the other evening so all of us that believe that there's a god the father and jesus christ is his his begotten son we must go down the road and go start our own uh joe's witness church okay and leave this church alone that is exactly what walter fight said well dr fight you know what you're already in the Catholic Church, so maybe us Jehovah's Witnesses should leave by now. So this book, okay, I want to ask him, is it the word? Dr. The Prayer's books are saturated with repeated reference to what the Seventh-day Adventist Belief book says, okay? He's, he, he writes, he says, also careful listener would have noticed in my presentation, even if he accepted that I repeatedly mentioned that our sharing was actually in the book called what seven Adventists believe and folks in the feast books that he wrote <laughs> it, it's there it's everywhere it's just littered throughout in the notes like i like i said if you ever get the book hopefully he will send you a copy if you're interested to, to go through the book don't read the book just read the annexure start there and then you go read the book because you will have a whole different view of of what is in that book so I just, like I said, I just wanted to read from the book. Oh, he, he mentions, of course, that in the book, um, his uh, Colossians 2, 14 to 16, that feast keeping is absolutely, it's in here, okay? There's one little paragraph, if you can see there, I've got it against my chest, okay? I've actually marked it many years ago when I was doing going through my, my uh, uh, this fellowship. One paragraph on, this is page 287 of this version, the small little thing. Uh, it here says, said he therefore let no one judge you in food and drink or regarding a festival uh, or the new moons and sabbaths which are shadow things to come but the substance is of christ since the contents of this passage deals with ritual matters the sabbaths here referred to are ceremonial sabbaths of the junior uh, jewish annual feasts and festivals which are a shadow a type of which the fulfillments were yet to come in christ doesn't say feast not keeping just quotes colossians it says then it misquotes and he agrees with this it says, likewise, in Galatians, Paul demonstrated against the observing of requirements of the ceremonial law. He said, you observe days, months, and seasons, and years. I'm afraid I have labored over you in vain. Okay. So nothing here really about it's illegal to keep the holy days. That's about all I could find. It's under the Sabbath. There's no voted statement in this book. It just merely refers vaguely and briefly to the feast. So that's the first mistake. And of course, then in there, I, I mentioned Dr. Richard Delofer. Um, you all know this famous e email. It's been on my presentations many times where Lofer basically says, and I, I read it here uh, at the bottom, he says about Ron's type of uh, uh, thing. It says, that is nonsense, okay? So first I will ask you a question about ordinances that were nailed to the cross. I'm very surprised that you say that most STA evangelists teach that idea. It is not the regular STA teach. Uh, it was not what I learned 40 years ago when I made my theological uh, studies. So it is, he says, the, according to the text, God has forgiven us by canceling our record of debt that stood against us, which is it legal, uh, legal demands. Okay. In other words, he goes on further to say, no law or anything of God was nailed to the cross. It was our debt, our record of our debt. And so you know that. So of course he he was he didn't agree with that, Doctor Dupria. Also on the Anders Bible, like I said, uh, he says there. By the way, the Anders Study Bible uh, you mentioned is not an official book. It was produced by uh, or produced by anybody in the GC. <laughs> Well, folks, um, there, there's off the official site. It says the project committee chaired by Andreasen was and uh, was charged with supervising the development. People like Dennis Fortain, Dean, Seventh Day Adventist Theological Cemetery, uh, Mark Finley. We all know Mark Finley, ne? General Conference Seventh Day Adventists. 
uh, Andrews University, Erno Gersi, business manager, Andrews University Press, Gary Cast, vice president, general conference of Seven Adventists, Ronald Knott, director, Andrews University, uh, John R. R. Prestol, under treasurer, general conference of Seven Adventists, and of course, his, his friend, Uncle Rodriguez, director, Biblical Research Institute. It's like the who's who of, of, of Adventism here, folks. But according to our good friend Ron, okay, this is like not the Bible to go and read with this commentary, okay, because it wasn't sanctioned by the GC. Uh, half the GC is in here. I don't know what sanction you would need, okay. Um, and then, by the way, you know, at the bottom here, this is a very practical tool for anyone wishing to uh, a deeper understanding of the Bible, but beyond usefulness it is an outstanding example of what spiritual scholarship is all about yeah so he he, he thinks it's inaccurate and uh, yeah but of course he's he's, he's a, a demon and so forth okay now i came across some other things while i was going in his book he quotes uh, richard davison quite a bit but you know richard davison wrote some of the the most beautiful articles on the fees and i i want to thank ron for that because I, I went and found them okay and i just want to quote you at the end go read this i'll, I'll put it on 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 the, uh, the the website or the facebook site you can go read it but read this this is truly truly inspirational written by a seven-day adventist pastor okay of andrews university he says we conclude our savoring of sukkot I share with the congregation that after the Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 CE, Jewish people were forced out of Jerusalem into exile in the diaspora. The feast was still celebrated in the synagogues and often in secret amid much suffering and persecution. But at the conclusion of these feasts, the parting greeting of the worshippers invariably at the same time was next year in Jerusalem. Still today, with the return of Jewish people to their homeland, the greeting continues, slightly modified, next time. Or next year in Jerusalem rebuilt. I invite my Christian brothers and sisters to join with our Jewish brothers and sisters and exclaim, next year, very soon, by God's grace, may we celebrate the ultimate feast of tabernacles in the new Jerusalem. Richard M. Davison, who wrote on the back of, of his book, which I still sort of wonder sometimes. The same gentleman wrote, I find this work, this is now on the feast book, I find this work comprehensive and incisive Bible-based response to those Christians today who both inside and outside the Adventist church are promoting the observance of the Jewish annual festival calendar. Ron Lapierre dealt, dealt quite carefully with the major arguments employed by modern-day feast keepers. I heartily recommend this book to all who are interested in what the Bible says about the subject. That and what's on the back of that book does not compute. And so the feast keeping movement is an antichrist movement. Okay, let me just show you that quickly. I hope you can hear this. Let's just go there. Oops. Now here's a quick hint folks. Did you know that feast keepers by keeping the feasts are doing what? Denying what? The Savior. the Savior. Listen to this carefully. The feast keeping movement is an antichrist movement. Now here's a quick hint, folks. Did you know that feast Did you hear that? The feast keeping movement is an antichrist movement. Can you see can you see my presentation again, Sandy? Guys, you can still see my presentation? We hear it. Yes. Uh, Okay, so you can see I'm back on the straw man one. Okay, okay. So, so that comes out of an extended, uh, he did a long, long presentation to a lot of pastors in America. And that comes out of that. And he's been saying that since around about 2010. So I put it on here. That's the, he says, the, here's a quick hint, folks. Did you know that peacekeepers, not peacekeepers, but that's uh, the, 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 um, uh, whatever the feast keepers by keeping the feast what are they doing denying what the savior listen to this carefully the feast keeping movement is an antichrist movement so what what ron Depree has always done is he's built straw men so he's made us the baddie okay and uh, 
you know, all these years now, people are now starting to really look at this and go, but what is the big issue here? What is really the issue? It's two basic misquotes of Mrs. White, and it's a total misdirection on Colossians, 4, Colossians 2, 14 to 16. And we must understand, and I'm saying this with a lot of respect, that Dr. De Pria, the main stay of his career, although he's an ethics professor and he's done a lot of other things, the mainstay of his career is this book, uh, What Is Not Seen, uh, where is it? Judging the Sabbath, okay, this one. This, is, this was his thesis, this was, this was what he put his word, discovering what cannot be found in Colossians 2.16. And he found stuff that I still are finding hard to find, okay? But just to show you something, okay? The people that wrote differently what he wrote to, okay, in his book, he says, for instance, about Bakiaki, and I know a lot of people go Bakiaki, Jesuit, et cetera, et cetera, and he's not, he's not far out of that. He says, for example, you mentioned the late Samuel Bakiaki, who was a church historian who was trained by the Roman Catholics and who tried to bring many strange views into Adventist church. I knew him personally, but he was not a biblical scholar. In fact, on just one page of his PhD dissertation, I could show you half a dozen errors. In fact, I was directly told by the actual leader involved that they at the GC directly asked him not to publish his personal opinions on the feast, but he merely ignored the council and self-published his own views. And you see, folks, here's, here's Ron, look at the book. And then you go look at that famous book from, from, Sunday to, uh, from Sabbath to Sunday, okay? Can you see? Is it easy to draw a, a thing? Man trying to write something similar, okay? And then on the festivals, this man went and he did a, a proper uh, a study of the festivals, wrote a book about it, and now Dr. Dupree does something different. And so in all of his books, he had to discredit Samuel Bakyoki, and he does it on a very personal basis. So for there for you to read. So go through it. There's a lot of it, okay? Uh, William Richardson, for instance, also, uh, this comes out of an email, uh, which R William Richardson also wrote some very nice things, okay? Uh, and somebody asked him about Richardson and quoted Richardson on certain things, also from Anders University. He says, a quick comment about Richardson. He was asked by the main theological organization of the SDA church to write an article on Colossians 2, 16 to 17. But when they received it and read it, they rejected it. So guess what? They approached your brother. Yes. And before my article was published for the World Church, it was okayed by more than 40 Adventist scholars from throughout the world. When I read that, I can sort of see the uh, pride in there, you know. I wrote it and 40 people checked it and, you know, it can't be wrong. But here is what that gentleman wrote. William E. Richardson, PhD, is chair of the Department of Religion. Andrews University, Bering Springs, Michigan. He was a very, very popular man at university. There's, there's stuff on the Andrews site that I read many years ago about him. Okay, and he wrote a very different exposition on Colossians 2, 14 to 17. And you can go read it. Um, I'm gonna go through it, I'm running out of time. This is one more important thing I need to finish off on. Okay, um, just then in memory of some of the victims, um, there are still many of them. There are still people because Dr. Dupree believes that uh, uh, morally it's correct to have people expunged from the church if they disagree in terms of doctrine, uh, that it's heresy. Uh, if anybody disagrees with him particularly, that's heresy. Uh, he has no fault in life. He never makes any mistakes. And uh, so... He is absolutely untouchable, okay? And I, if you read that letter, that comes from, from uh, you'll remember in 2014, myself and uh, Kuno was being absolutely hounded by the church. And uh, yeah, let's just say that continued right up until recently. So I want to read to you something very shocking that I found in this book that uh, Dr. De Priya wrote. Uh, Dr. De Priya wrote. And uh, up until now, I've known about this and I've, I've, I've never wanted to say anything. But this last week when I, I read some, some testimonies about people who were being affected by, 
by some of the things that that he's been doing worldwide uh, some people losing their jobs again i thought you know maybe it should be time that we we we, we maybe just go back in time and maybe just show that nobody's perfect okay and so dr de Pria wrote this book no fear for the future uh, i think it was 2006 um was published the second time okay 2006 second printing 2006 you can't find this book anymore by the way it's you can't find it anywhere but i've got it okay and under the title and i want you to listen very carefully here and i'm going to read it and i'm going to try and be unemotional personal perspectives impact people Dr. Dupriya says, I need to share one more short story to demonstrate how what we believe affects others. I will never forget that evening. I was a young man studying theology in South Africa when I attended a school concert on a Saturday night. During the program, a friend of mine, a 16-year-old academy student, tapped me on the shoulder and whispered, Ron, I need to talk with you. Yes. I need to talk with you right now. Okay, okay. So I got up and walked outside. This teenager turned to me and said, Ron, I have a big, big problem. Problem? Yes. I am pregnant. What should I do? Since I was a theology student and a friend, she felt comfortable coming to me for advice on a perplexing personal problem. But back then, I really had not given the matter of the unborn careful study. I knew that Genesis 2-7 indicated that the body plus breath equals a living being. Thus, I had concluded that unless and until the unborn took its first autonomous breath, it was not human, but simply a thing. Believing this, I turned to this young lady and said, go ahead, you should have an abortion. It's just a thing. It's not a person. Go ahead. In, these, in those days, abortions were illegal in South Africa. So she went to a backstreet abortion clinic. She survived the abortion. I had helped her take care of her problem. But had I really? Two years later, she was 18, single and pregnant again. And sometimes our thinking, what we believe, how we relate to others has an impact uh, um, on others. I tried to help this young lady by getting rid of the evidence of her problem. Instead of helping her with the real issue at stake, her promiscuous, godless lifestyle. Therefore, what we need to do in our study here is to discover and identify biblical principles so that we can know how to live ethical lives that will bring glory to Jesus Christ for everything we do, everything we say impacts ourselves as well as others, both now and eternally. Imagine a seven-day Adventist young pastor telling a 14 year old or a 16 year old in South Africa, which is ultra conservative to go. And by the way, when I read that, I saw no empathy, nothing. It was more about her godless lifestyle than the person itself. So at the end of this evening, he obviously in his email offered perhaps those who watch your talk will take the time to actually read my book, which I'm willing to send free to anyone who would like to see what it is in context. Folks, I've paid a lot of money for these books. Um, if you'd like to send him an email, there is his email. You can mention my name. Okay, I don't think it's very popular out there, but um, you're welcome to write that down uh, and ask him for a book um, in one of the earlier presentations there where he does the thing about us being antichrist in the background there's boxes and boxes of his books 
that he printed many years ago. I don't think too many of these things were ever sold because they never sold in my shop. Um, I was the only one reading them, only one watching them. Okay, everybody else had an opinion about them, but nobody actually read them. Okay, so that's why I know what his books say. That's why I know what this book, for instance, say. And there's a lot of other things in here, which if you ever got to read this book and some of the others and the way he spoke about people and still speaks about people, there's no empathy. There is no love in whatever he says. And that, folks, is why I make the indictment against him. Because what he's doing might be in his mind be to the advantage and to the honor of God, but I cannot see Jesus ever doing this. Leviticus 23 says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Our Father in heaven, Lord, this has been a serious subject this evening, and I thank you, Lord, for leading me through it. Lord, I'm going to ask that you, you change the good doctor's mind or that you do anything that to influence what he thinks. I think sometimes people, and I include myself, are on a, on a road somewhere and we find out things and we have to discover things the hard way. Like Dr. DePierre says, what we believe impacts others. And especially if we start enforcing what we believe on others. Lord, I know that every single person sitting here has gone through some type of persecution for the mere sake that they are honoring you, that they are worshiping you. And Ellen White so clearly states that in the end times, Satan will attack us on worship. Seven-day Adventists have also gotten so many weird things like the agape lunches and dinners that they hold on crosses with flashing lights, pastries. How can that ever, ever, ever be to your honor? We ask, Lord, that people see this. And I hope, really hope, Lord, that people see that in my heart, I really, really feel for those who are on the receiving end. I pray for everybody in the church again, Lord. Be with them. Lead them. And let us all each see each other again in Jerusalem soon. Ask us in the mighty name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, Hein. I have a question. When sure. was that um, book published? Yeah. This one, 2006. You see, I've got everything of his. I've made a study of the man over the last 10 years. He, he writes an email to me and he thinks he's going to impress me. Really, I know him better than his wife knows him, I can promise you. <laughs> Because you know what? I've had to read through hundreds of emails of people who wrote to me. Um, I had so many conversations with uh, maybe a lot of you as well. Okay. We've, we've had other speakers on Bible explorations and other uh, forums. Okay. And this is not about getting to Ron de Priya. This really is about the damage, to highlight the damage that can be done to people. People lose their faith in God. People all miss being part of an organized church. The fellowship. Is that what the Lord wants? Is, is, is that what a person goes out like a theologian and goes out there and speaks to people who do not have a theological background, gives them all this unfathomable amount of, of information that he's now studied over a period of time, because I can tell you now, not one person in my church today even knows the, the name of the book, okay? But they came after me like with hook, line, and sinker, like they came after Solomon, they came after Clyde Langley, um, all of us. 
they did not read these books ever. It was like it, it was like the mob mentality. And 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 those things is what Dr. Dupriya must realize. You ruin people's lives. They, I promise you, the Lord has a very special place for you. Mm. And it's not where you think it is. Mm. Well, hi, and this is why that uh when I went through the presentation of this is a stat or what is a statute, I went through the Old Testament showing uh, we are to keep all the statutes. And yeah. then I went and showed that the feast days are statutes. So you are going, when you say you don't, uh, you don't have to keep the feast, what you're saying is you don't have to keep all the statutes, only <laughs> some of them. And you're kind of laughing at God for when he says you must keep all the statutes. Yeah. But you see, um, uh, uh, Keith, you know, it's not even about that. You know, if they got the terminology right, if they knew, if they started talking about statutes, maybe we'd go halfway to actually them understanding what it is. And that Adventists don't, don't believe in statutes, okay? They think that all of those things like clean and unclean, and not fornicating with your mother-in-law and all of those type of things, okay, is just not my, the rest of whatever the Lord said, okay? They don't put a name to it. The well, moment I they put a name to it, that's where was, the problem starts for them. I was listening to Bible Explorations this morning when John was speaking, and he was going into Paul's writings, and he would say, you know, thou shalt not steal. He would say, this is a commandment. And then the next one, this is a statute. Mm -hmm. Then another mm -hmm. one, this is a statute. Then another one, yeah. this is a commandment. Identifying where they came from in the Old Testament. Yeah. yeah. We all know that. We've all watched Elder John, and we know that. We know it all foul. I know the stuff all foul. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then I, and I go read a, a book, because the updated version um, of the feast <coughs> book is, is, is now an expanded version. I think it's about another 30 pages to it, okay? Which is now we answer some of the questions that, that came on later on. So he, he extended the book and up, up lift it and put it further. You know, um, just what he writes in those notes. You know, don't call me brother if you write stuff like that. Please don't. I'm not your brother. Okay? You know, not if what you're writing there. Because, <laughs> because you, you, you are playing the person not the ball, as we say in South Africa. We play rugby, so uh, he will understand the anal analogy, okay? So you are supposed to play the ball, not the person. In this case, he's playing the person, not the ball. And uh, that's illegal. But um, you know what? We've said what we've well, said. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll send him a link to this thing. Sandy, I, 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 hope, I hope that's okay. Um, because I have done it in terms of what he's asked, and I've put all the, everything out in the open. He's welcome to reply to it. Um, and I've quoted what he says, not what I've said. Hi. Also, in the first book of uh, Revelation, it says, he, it talks about a people who think that they have everything and need 